have two of the exhibiting artists present, uh, but this program today will be uh, a conversation with uh, Kevin Williams. And Kevin uh, grew up in Chicago, South Side, and I just found out about 20 some odd years ago he moved to Atlanta and is living there now. He is probably um, the most celebrated figurative storyteller of this era, and his urban art prints are the most widely circulated African American art prints in the world. And we're very excited to have him here today. Art space. Ah, this is so cool. And uh, thank you, um, thank you, Epe, for believing in my idea of showing your collection. Um, we are we are streaming this today through uh, Instagram. So if you're interested in looking at it, I think you can get it again. I don't know because I don't like this stuff. But um, <laughs> so this exhibition we are extending uh, through uh, February. Uh, Corey, can you tell me exactly the date? That uh, we're, is it the first? Oh. When this show comes down. March 1st. March 1st, yeah. See, it takes a village. <laughs> but I want to thank all of you. Uh, how many people here is this the first time you've been to Art Space? All right. <laughs> so you've got to come back. Uh, we are a community art center. We mentor 150 high school students from 14 different high schools. Some of them are here today, I saw them. Uh, uh, they come in groups of 12, and uh, we teach printmaking and all different uh, medias uh, with these students. And uh, it's like a wonderful experience. So anyway, thank you. And uh, I've also invited uh, Skip Hill to come and moderate this kind of conversation, and he will uh, talk to you about uh, any kind of questions that you might have with Kevin. So, Kevin. <laughs> come on up here. Come on, Skip. First of all, let me say what a distinct honor it is to have this gentleman here with us. I can certainly speak for myself by saying I've been a long fan of him and his work uh, and certainly his unique way of doing it. And, but even before that, I just want to say thank you all for being here. It's kind of like we didn't know how many people were going to be here this afternoon. And I love the fact that we had to go find more chairs here. So that's really great. I, I think. Um, uh, you deserve it, and certainly uh, uh, you'll be enriched by being here. To me, art space at Untitled feels like home to me, even though I live in Tulsa. For those of us who are Oklahoma City or in this community, this art family of Oklahoma City of artists, uh, some old heads here, some young heads here, this is this is a wonderful space to be in. And uh, so I'm thrilled to have each and every one of you here. It's really, really nice. <laughs> Is it not? It's really nice to see. I'm like, okay, I thought we were just going to have like 12 people even. Now we're packing it in. So it's great. Um, Mr. Kevin Williams, probably better known by his acronym of his name going backwards, WAC, uh, <laughs> is indeed what we refer to, or I like to refer to as a, um, an urban legend that's real. Yeah? I think what most impressed me about your career coming into contact with you as a young artist myself, um, trying to, you know, it, there's a, there's this kind of standardized, what we like to believe is a standardized way of becoming an artist. It's kind of been cultivated in you go to art school, you get an undergraduate degree, then you get a master's of fine art, and then even though they never teach you about how to do business, because you're getting that master's of fine art, you're kind of thrown out into the world to do that. And that's typically the way that it's supposed to be done. Kevin, on the other hand, took had his own unique path 
that didn't involve any of that. And for me, that was very impressive. Um, the idea that uh, an artist didn't have to go through the typical channels of entering into the art world. And, and we all know there are different art worlds in the art world. For me, as a young African-American artist trying to, in Oklahoma, trying to find my way and trying to figure out how does this thing work? Do I need to do this? Do I need to go here? Do I need to go to Yale or whatever? It was, and I discovered your work. Okay. And it was work that was accessible in the sense of these are my people. I know these people. I recognize these people in the barbershop and in the beauty salon. This idea that you could create art that speaks to people who are not uh, traditionally art collectors or art patrons or uh, was fascinating to me. And so he carved his own path, a unique path. And it's, uh, for me, it's been very impressive, very <coughs> authentic, very uniquely yours. And so, longtime admirer. Oh, uh, okay. Of course, I, I, you know, I, I recall the prints, those early prints, and then when you started introducing fraternities and sororities, uh, I thought, okay, this guy is, this is some authentic stuff here. This is real, this is not a idealistic, uh, Eurocentric, quite frankly, you the world, this is our stories. Uh, captivated in a wonderful way, high quality, wonderful attention to detail, representational work. And so when Laura told me that he was gonna be here, I thought, wait a minute, what? He, he's gonna be here? She goes, oh, I've already got some of his paintings. I was like, well, you have art, his art in here? And so it's great to see your work in 3D. It's great to see it in Oklahoma. That's one of those things I would thought, yeah, he, this dude ain't ever gonna be in Oklahoma. I mean, these, these kind of people don't, they don't come to Oklahoma. But we need to have you in places like this. You have people who, just like in Atlanta and Chicago and Detroit and wherever, you have fans here too who know, if they don't know you, they know your work. They know your work. So uh, we're happy to have you here and I just wanna to introduce to our collective group here, Mr. Kevin Williams. Like Skip, so. Am I loud? <laughs> it's, it's, it's rich. So, hi. What well, I'm so glad to be here in, in OKC. Um, and I want to give special thanks to EGPE, um for bringing me in and also being a investor in my work and developing it to a great friend. Um, it's been one of the most beautiful acquisitions that's happened in my life. Um, just meeting a collector that has an agenda and a passion for not only culture, but humanity. Uh, I wanna thank Skip uh, for stepping in and doing yeah. this. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. And uh, thank him for Art Space Untitled as well for having me. It's a beautiful space. Um, James, um, Egg Page's right hand, has been showing me an amazing time in OKC. Uh, I'm thankful for the beautiful weather. I was able to take a 23 minute walk over here, uh, which was cool to get in my little cardio, required cardio. So um, yeah, so everything is cool. So a little bit about me. I did grow up in Chicago. Um, I was discovered, I went to a vocational high school in Chicago called Chicago Vocational. And you picked a trade there. And my initial trade was to be an architect. Um, and, I, and part of my study in architecture, I had to study heat and air conditioning repair. <laughs> so in the heat and air conditioning repair uh, class, I got bored and I was zoned out and I would start drawing. I got caught drawing, uh, was reprimanded by the instructor, and he says, hey, the art department is directly across the hall. <laughs> and I said, I have no interest in being an artist. He says, well, I need you to draw something for me for extra credit since you're drawing in my class. So he had me do a drawing of his dog. <laughs> so I drew his dog, he showed it to the art teacher across the hall. I didn't know that Chicago Vocational was one of the top 
art departments in the country. <laughs> and a gentleman named Robert Johnson, who was my art instructor, uh, who's still living, he's 91 now. I uh, just went and visited him recently when I was in Chicago. Um, basically taught me my fundamentals in art. So he was a trained and degreed artist and that's where my drawing skills came from and painting and my evolution and that's why I'm able to do both at this point. So my foundation uh, was based in an educational format. Uh, being discovered at that point, uh, my father was actually a mathematician and they wanted to speak with my parents about me majoring in art. I was personally against it, but he wanted <laughs> me to um, go through some exercises and draw from live, a live model. And they actually had a modeling platform, just like the colleges at the school. So the benches, everything, I had never worked with charcoal. He said, you got 40 minutes, students sat up there clothed. <laughs> and I drew them. I probably tapped out 30 minutes in. So he says, you know, have you had any training? I said, no. He said, I'd like to speak with your parents. So I said, oh man, not the parents, you know. <laughs> so I knew my dad was like completely not on board with a creative career. Um, and then during that time, the Rye Institute was like all over the news, I mean, all over the TV. And it's like, you know, I'm going to DeVry, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, they talked to my parents, they say, okay, let me work with him for one year. I'm gonna enter him in every competition, local and national. I think your son can get a scholarship. Excuse me, Kevin, how old are you at this point? 16, okay. I think your son can get a scholarship. That was the magic words to my father. <laughs> Let's do it, right? <laughs> so he's entering me in everything. And he noticed right off that I wasn't interested in art. So I couldn't go through the regular curriculum, like, like drawing squares and shadows and like none of that. So he said, okay, you can draw, and I thank God for him doing this. He said, you can draw whatever you want to draw. And that's, that laid the road work for my whole career. And to this day, one of my <laughs> issues is that I paint exactly what I want to paint. I don't necessarily create in themes and in series and, and consistency of a certain look. I just kind of do what I want to do, but that's kind of how it came in. Um, ended up winning the Scholastic uh, Scholarship to the School of Visual Arts in New York. I had a full ride. My parents were from Memphis, Tennessee and migrated to Chicago. So Chicago was as big as they wanted to go. So I was told I had to turn down my scholarship to the School of Visual Arts in New York. I picked all New York institutes because in our class, we had these Society of Illustrator books and all the artists were in New York. So I said, I wanna to go to school in New York, you know? Cause back then you could be an illustrator. That was like right. a, a huge job scenario. Um, so I ended up turning that down. I ended up going to school at the Art Institute of Chicago, which wasn't a bad school <laughs> by any means, but a fine art scenario was way different than an illustration direction. So I ended up forfeiting my, I wasn't a cool kid. You know, I was, I was turbulent. So I ended up walking away from my scholarship because I didn't like the Art Institute. I ended up going to a school called Columbia which was right around the corner from the American Academy of Art. I wanted to go to the American Academy of Art because that's where Thomas Blackshear went, Alex Ross, and all these great illustrators from Marvel. A lot of them went to um, the American Academy of Art. So I ended up at Columbia, had a short stay there for a couple years, um, dropped out of there. The top student in the school was arguing in the placement department because he couldn't find a job. And that was my cue. My parents were out of town. They come back. I dropped out of school, <laughs> out of college, right? My father loses it because he was a mathematician, taught school during the day, and at night he worked at the post office. So he had got me a summer job at the post office. While I was dropping out of college, I simultaneously 
quit the post office. <laughs> now, the thing with the post office, I won, they had an art fair that they had at the lobby, the main lobby at the post office. And I won the art fair. And I'm working a graveyard shift, and there's this old man that works in the trailer with me. I'm unloading trucks, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica, to be specific. And it was grueling. And I'm depressed, and I'm in there, and I'm like having these dreams of being this artist, but I'm pulling these bags, right? And so he walks past me. We're passing each other in the trailer. It's dark. And he says, congratulations. I see you won the art fair. Last person I would have thought would have went to see the him. Yeah, he would be him. Last <laughs> Pass him by again, two times. He stops me, looks at me right in my eye, and says, "Son, don't let this stepping stone be your gravestone." Wow. I quit the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> when I quit. I mean, my father was, I don't know how he didn't kill me. Like, literally, I, I, to this day, I'm so thankful because as a parent, I would have lost it. Yeah. I mean, would have lost it. And so I decided at that point I would build my own path. So and while I was in high school, I worked with hair salons in my neighborhood. So in Chicago, uh, 87th Street, where I went to high school. My high school was on 87th Street, and then there was one of the largest black business owned business districts was on 87th Street. So I would leave out of school and just walk down there. And where I had my hair cut at, I tried to get them to buy some art. They said, well, no, we don't need no art. You know, you're in the hood, son. You know, what, what am I supposed to do with that? What are we going to do with some art, you know? So he said, man, go next door to the hair salon. You know, the ladies over there might, may buy something. So I walk in, and it's, it's like 1983, 84, right? And I see the sister get out of this car, and she's in this convertible Mercedes. It's the winter. It's like fall. She's got this fur coat on. It's like Diana Ross getting out of this car. And she owns, her name is Iris, and she owns Iris Nails. And that's how long ago it, it, it was because it was a black owned nail salon. <laughs> so, so, I'm sorry. Not a but, <laughs> no, the, the black owned, all black nail tech. So, and anyway, um, she says, babe, same thing. Babe, you don't need no hard work. She said, talk to the girls in the hair salon next door. So I go to the hair salon. They say, eh, we don't really need nothing. We don't have a price list, though. Can you do us a price list? So I said, okay, cool. My lettering skills was decent. Because back then, you no photos, none of that. No. You just freehand. No chart pack either. Right. So I do the price list, and I do a drawing on there of a woman with her hair done real nice. So when I deliver it, they're like, oh, man, I love the drawing. I love the drawing. You know, the, <laughs> the lettering is cool, but we really love the drawing. So they're like, can you do something for the inside? And that's how I began my business. Man. And so I would walk down each avenue in Chicago. Thank God it was on the grid. And so I would go from 87th Street to 79th to 75th to 71st. And I would go up and down all the way to the train, which was maybe three miles. I'll walk three miles that way, go down, take the train down the next avenue, walk back. And you're carrying a portfolio? I'm carrying a portfolio. Okay. So, she says, well, every Friday, that's when we make our money. So if we can pay you a little something every Friday, that's how we'll do it. So I put everybody on payment plans. <laughs> and every Friday, I mean, my pocket is fat. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And I'm, re <laughs> I'm reinvested in my work, right? But I still had to illustrate a dream. So during the day, I'm downtown Chicago, walking around with a portfolio because I, I was so shy. I would never walk into a business. So I'm waiting on somebody to ask me what's in my portfolio. <laughs> like literally. One of the companies that I was trying to get was Soft Sheen Hair Products. And they were located on 87th Street as well. Major corporation on the same avenue in the neighborhood. Right? So I get stopped. They had a product called Sporting Waves, and this is back when I had hair. <laughs> you ever have a jerry curl? 
I had, I had the waves, right? <laughs> so they stopped me. Somebody stops me and says, hey, look, we're doing test shots. You want to come over here and take some test shots to, you know, model on the bots? I'm like, cool, whatever, right? I go take the test shots. It's at a place called Brainstorm Advertising. They're the ones that did Soft Sheen's advertising. Take the pictures. I'm walking out, and it's a guy named, who's passed away uh, several years ago, named Craig Rex Perry, who was one of the, if not, he was the only cosmetology illustrator of people of color before I came in. He had all the accounts in the city. I mean, he was killing it. All right, everywhere I went, he had the account. Got our director comes out, I'm waiting on the elevator. He's like mad, he's telling the receptionist, find me somebody to do this illustration for the Regal Theater. We're opening, Rex hasn't brought anything, I'm standing right there. Yeah, that's like a movie. Right. <laughs> I get the job to do that, and that's when I started doing the, um, when you would buy the hair care product, they would have a direction kit inside. And my job became drawing the step-by-steps of how to obtain a hairstyle. So like line drawing. Right. Line drawing. But part of that was I had to work with a hairstyle, because, hairstylist because they wanted it to be correct. So I had to learn how to, where they would part it, which way you would curl it. That's when I started to have to study the skull, the occipital bone, and different things like that, which increased my anatomy. Working on the hair thing, um, I wasn't, I didn't come up poor, but I wasn't like, I didn't have like the latest, you know what I'm saying? So there was a fashion designer who named Barbara Bates, um, and she did clothes for Michael Jordan and Oprah and Will Smith, and she uh, specialized in leather. And she would do those multicolored leather jackets from back in the day. And so she couldn't draw. And a friend of mine that was a model was like, you need to talk to her. So I ended up becoming her fashion illustrator. So that led to me doing fashion illustration and cosmetology. So I became extremely sought after in those two fields. Um, and mostly I would do color pencil and airbrush, a mixture of the two, um, for fur companies. So my last account in that industry was with a place called Gross and Over Furs out of uh, Canada. So. Fast forward, I go through the hair industry. I end up falling out with a major figure in the hair industry. The guy paid me to go to the International Beauty Show in New York and to paint live while to draw a crowd to sell his videos, his instructional videos. That was the deal. When we got there, he started charging for my paintings Instead, and I said, hey, that's not right. He said, hey, look, you can either do this or find your way back to Chicago. <laughs> so I went out, you know, I'm, I'm in New York. I'm doing portraits on the corner. I get my money, get enough money, I get back home, Man. right? Mm -hmm. Get back home. I said, I'm going to go to this other company. I, every company I went to after that, I couldn't get hired. I got blackballed by him. So I said, I knew from going to the salons that some of the posters that I would do for the hair care companies would have the product on there. And the companies didn't, I mean, the stylists, if they didn't use the product, they didn't want to put their poster up. So I said, well, let me just do the drawings without the product and print it. I didn't think people would buy reproductions of a painting. And Ended up launching my own publishing company. Um, it was called Nabalungi, and that meant beautiful one in, um, in Africa. And so um, that ended up becoming really successful. And this is how I'm trying to give you some legwork of how I got into the printing. No, man, you know what I'm saying? Fascinating stuff. And so I um, started printing my own work, and then I got back on with the, the hair companies because they saw I was gaining traction. Okay, so then in 1998, I had just left Chicago, moved to Atlanta, and I get a call from a company, Alberta Culver. Now, Alberta Culver um, produced a product called Motions, 
and Motions was a leading product in the black hair care industry. And so the guy calls me, a guy named Ron Hamill, and he says, hey, hey look, I got this opportunity for you. He said, uh, we tried to get Ernie Barnes to do this painting, uh, which would be a, like an art piece for salons, and it would be like women in the hair salon. He told us that he wanted a quarter meal to paint it, right? He said, we, we, we're just not gonna do it. So he's like, we'll give you $10,000. <laughs> I said, we'll give you 10 grand, Since you know, and we, right, and we want the original, oh, you know, no. and you, you know, you do it. I said, okay, cool. So I do it. It's called Standard Appointment, and there's four black women in the hair salon under hair dryers, like the 1960s comb hair dryers, <laughs> and they're socializing and all that, right? So this piece ends up becoming the most recognized piece in cosmetology history to this day. Mm, that, okay? That's what I'm saying. I'm thinking... I was going to ask a show of hands, how many people know that poster? Because I know people do. So, like, it's so this is crazy. So about the, about the business thing, I didn't know anything about the business. Like people come at me a lot and say, oh, you, you, know, you understand the business. I had to learn by trial and error. So, but one of the things when I sold the piece to them, I had wrote my invoice and I wrote on there for promotional use only because that's what they told me. So I'm at the hair show, I got my little booth with my hair posters, right? This big corporation, they had the piece idea for them and they got this staff and everything. And they're supposed to give away the poster when you buy a kit. They did the same thing the hairdresser did, they flipped it. They said, if you guys buy the poster, you get the kit for free. So they done sold the whole, I mean, just, it's a mountain of tubes. They done sold everything, right? Two days into a four day show. Their staff comes over to my booth and they're singing, literally singing, and thanking me for such a great, doing such a great job. I'm pissed. Yeah. Right? Excuse me. Are you selling anything at your booth? Yeah, I'm selling, okay. but I'm not All selling right. like that. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> so, next year comes up. This is a big hair show in Atlanta called the Brown and Brothers Hair Show. Brown and Brothers. Big hair show comes up, and I'm standing at my booth, and this lady walks by me and she's dragging this big shopping bag and the image is on the shopping bag oh. my image so i go over to the guy right i say hey what's up with the bag oh man man you know you know just just send me an invoice I said, okay cool so i could tell by his disposition he was nervous i said yeah let me see it 20 grand let me send you an invoice for 20k I waited four months for my money to get that 10K. Three days later, that 20K showed up at my door. I said, okay, cool. They, they did something wrong. Next year, same thing. I said, hey, what's up with the bag? He said, just send me another invoice. I said, okay, this went on for seven years. What? Right? So seven years later, he says, hey, look, can we just buy all the rights to it? So I called a friend of mine's that was an attorney. I said, hey, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> he, said, he said, when you gave them an invoice and you wrote for promotional, for promotional use only on there, you didn't sign over the rights to them, so you still own the rights. That's why they paying you every time you walk up to them. That. So then they ended up paying me, um, they ended up paying me a, a sizable amount of money to buy all the rights. So I ended up getting the same 250 that Ernie was going to get. <laughs> it took me seven years to get it. Though, so it was good. That's good. That's great. So, uh, you know, I, I, I love that, again, this is an alternative way to go about this business. Right. And how you came into the art world through the hair world, mm -hmm. the world. Which, let's think about it. How much money is spent in the African American community billions. alone on yeah, hair billions. care products? Yeah. So even though it's not something you think off the top of your head that this is the way to get into it, ideally, yeah. it's a, it actually was a good venue into uh, for what you were doing. Yeah. Here's what, here was one of my questions. So they were using illustrations. Were they not? Was photography not being used much at that time? As far as pro, I'm trying to figure out how was it that well, a, a shoot a shoot was more expensive. Okay, easier to have. You got awesome. right. So you you know, and then you, sometimes you just want to break the look up. So that's where the art came from. Um, 
So you did for you. It was a business. Was it a business first, or was it art first, or was it? No, it was all. It was always art first. Okay. Um, but Keep then, in mind that you didn't really like art. Well, I, I didn't. So I had to do things that kept me interested in it, you know. So survival will keep you, <laughs> keep you interested in it, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, it was how I ended up making my money, you know. So once I started to learn that part of it, that the licensing and other things, it was like, okay, wow, it's actually, this can be very lucrative. And the reproduction thing was cool, I just didn't know how to distribute it. So in 1995, when I created um, the Urban Black Love series, which was uh, five paintings that told a story of a couple coming together, falling in love and creating a family, um, and still selling to this day, um, 28 years later. That series happened in such a honest way so I was dating a young lady who was Hispanic. And every time we would go out, I mean, the sisters would just drag me, right? You know, what are you doing over there? You know, that type of thing, right? And so she broke up with me. She was like, hey, you're not driven enough for me. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm probably one of the most driven people you ever meet. And so I'm trying to pause that to fall in love, right? And so she's like, nah, you're not driven enough. So she breaks up with me. I said, okay, I'm gonna paint this picture. So I paint this picture of a man with a woman over his shoulder, which the reference was from a Calvin Klein Obsessions ad. Obsessions Cologne, it just came out. And so I flipped it, made them black, you know, re-imaged it, you know, did this movement behind it. And I did it nude because they were nude on there and I was tired of painting clothes and hair. So I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna be naked, I'm gonna do this. And I took it to a gallery. I painted when I painted it. My power was off. This was crazy. It was the winter time. My power was off. I'm still in electricity. I'm working out of a basement of a meat cat packing company in the West Loop of Chicago. Right. So I take it to the one gallery which was next door to All Jokes Aside, which was a black-owned comedy club. The guy ended up becoming my business partner, and that went way south eight years later. But it's what made my name what it was. So the collateral damage was worth the relationship for me. And I knew he was going to screw me over. He, he, you know, he pretty much told me when we agreed to become partners. He said, you know all business relationships. Yeah, he said, you know all business relationships in. So I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, cool. So we ended up be becoming partners in the whole nine. And, and, and when the Black Love series came out, I took the original, taking it back to him. I was trying to sell it to him for $500 to get my power back on. He refused to buy the piece. He said, but I like it, I'm gonna put it in the window. And the way he had the easel in the window, the line to the comedy club when Steve Harvey and all these people were coming up, Bernie they would perform there, Bernie Mac. They would perform there and the line would run right in front of the gallery window. And so, he had the name on there, taking her back. So I'm this was before I was triggered to make it a series. And people were in the window laughing and commenting. They loved the pieces. Like, hey, I know where he's taking her to, <laughs> right? So I'm like, that's it, I'm gonna make it a, a story. And that's what, where I became a storyteller. It was from that point, I said, okay, I'm gonna do this, 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 and this. So me and this guy become partners. I think I'm being safe. I'm like, you take half the inventory, I take half. I don't trust you. Right, he knew how to move the work, so he would get in his car, he'd go to different festivals around the country. I'd be in Chicago broke, you know. I'd go in the gallery to check in on him, and he'd like give me some money, like out of guilt, like you don't know what you're doing, like you need to let me do this, right? So he's like, we need to become partner, fifty fifty. I said, okay, cool. I said, I don't have any money. He said, we'll take your money from your sales and put it into your 50%. And, you know, we're going to do this. We rolled for eight years. Um, it started off so meek and it blew up so fast. So it was like I had no, I, had, I wasn't financially literate at all. So you're talking about 1995. You know, I'm pushing a million and a half a year in inventory. Prints probably cost you a dollar to make. You understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's like printing your own money at that point. I'm young. Thank God I wasn't, my vices were like material. <laughs> like I like cars and stuff like that. I wasn't on drugs. I still don't drink. Um, so it was, it, 
you know, I, I went through my seasons. Uh, he ended up falling on some hard times, getting on drugs, sold his portion of the rights to third parties. So I ended up having to compete against myself in the industry, against my own work. And it was an independent line that no one could get. And I mean, we were able to state our price for decades, you know. And so when he, um, when he went under, um, there's an artist named Annie Lee. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Annie Lee. Annie Lee, Annie Lee. Um, what's her name? Lizzo just did a video, well, she did a performance on one of the night shows, uh, Jimmy Fallon or something like that. And she acted out one of Annie Lee's famous paintings called Blue Monday. And so Annie, Annie was like my industry mother. So at the height of the beef, and it was like death row level beef with that kind of money involved. <laughs> it was just was art was the product instead of music. And so she calls me on a day that I was getting ready to do something extremely stupid. She calls me. She says, hey, look. She said, those 52 paintings are only a blink of your career. Don't do anything stupid. Go get you a canvas and go paint you something. She said, art got you into this. Art to get you out of this. And God rest her soul, she literally probably saved my life that day. So, um, how did you know her? How did you all meet? Just, just in the community? Or Annie was from Chicago. Right, I knew that. So my price point and everything came from Annie. Annie's work was forty-five dollars a print, and the guy was like, "Hey, your work is hot. We're gonna make yours forty-five dollars a print." And we just shadowed her footprint throughout the industry. I wanted to be a fine artist though initially. But because I could see what was happening, I just let it ride out. And I was like, because I, when I painted the naked, the new work, I just thought it would go in a few man caves. I never, I never thought it would be like mainstream, like just out there, like, I mean, way out there. And so when it went out there at that level, it was like, okay, let me just, I'm going to have to pause. But one of the most prolific things that happened that was said after all the legal work was done and everybody went their own way and I was so pissed because he had took money and, and, and I mean it was terrible I mean it was tactical because he was a CEO he was a CFO he controlled the money and so you know you end up with tax debt you end up with a lot of things a hole you got to throw you know climb up out of but on that day he said to me you should feel liberated and I was so angry when he said that to me but he was absolutely right and from that point I really took a complete control of my own destiny I've had a kind of a tag of being independent but it's not necessarily by choice it's based on having the right relationship I don't believe in, in ownership of, of myself I want somebody owning me like we can have partnerships we can build together but not, you can't own me. I'm not, I'm not cool with that. So artistically, I kind of don't want to hear uh, too much outside of my own creative mind. You know, it has to, my narrative is my narrative. It's for all of humanity. It's initially targeting my culture and my race truth. But it's for all of humanity to be enlightened of us as a people. And going that direction for me is my level of commitment for a lifetime. If it means I don't get into certain spaces or certain placement or certain praises while I'm alive, because I'm for sure I'll probably get there once I'm dead, then okay, you know. But that's kind of been the, the journey. So it hasn't broken your heart that you're not on the cover of Art News or Art Magazine, I mean, Art in America, the, the Art Forum, you know, that the whole kind of institutional gallery type deal. It's not, it's not a heartbreak. You know, you know what's beautiful, because it it's ironic, because um, there's a brother here that's in the exhibition, Robert Peterson, that's, that's doing all of those things. He's awesome. And he's in the room. He's awesome. And Robert, uh, where's Robert? He's back there. Okay. Robert is doing all those things. And one of the beautiful things about this industry is if you have a security in yourself, then you can actually watch someone else 
be celebrated in a capacity that you may even desire and have pure joy to see that it's happening. And if it's happening, then it's still possible. Do you understand what I'm saying? And everything is in its divine order and divine time. And you have to be able to step outside of your own accomplishments and say, and a lot of us, we end up in trouble because we don't have, we don't reach across to one another and say, hey, look, I got into this situation. They trying to do this with my work. What, what, how should I approach licensing? Or how should I control my body of work or own it? You know, and it's because we've been trained to segregate ourselves based on uh, influence and classism and, and, and all kind of other stuff. So um, for me, it'll be in time. I feel like it all happened. Yeah. Um, I think you're there. Yeah, it's just that um, I think you're there. there is a price that you pay to to want to be successful while you're alive too in the arts. And at times, um, that's just that's just part of the industry. It's not. Uh, it is an industry. Yeah. You know, it has an infrastructure. It's like you represent yourself in court. That's a, you know, that, that, that can go bad for you, you know? So, you know, at times you need to pay the best attorney, you know, to get representation so you can walk, you know what I'm saying? So the gallery is, is, is a pivotal uh, entity in our industry and the relationship with the gallery is, is divine. I'm looking for the proper relationships and representation and someone who can see me. If you can see me, then we, we can do great things. I think we can do unprecedented things. Um, but if the doors are closed, then I'm always gonna open my own door. Beautiful. You know, I, I, I can go back to, I think I had this conversation about something like art news. Your uh, hottest artists under 30, mm -hmm. and they're on the cover of the magazine, and they're featured, and they're the hot artists, and it's 1985. 92 or 96 and then you don't hear about those people in it. They have a moment where they're the hot thing and they get all the media attention, maybe a couple of collectors uh, and then they kind of peer out. Mm -hmm. There's, it's really tough to maintain longevity in that type of atmosphere and I would imagine some of those people would admire if not envy the longevity of your relevance as an artist. I imagine some of these people have gone on to teaching, I don't know if they've gone on to sell insurance or whatever <laughs> it is, but this idea that you think about every year art schools churn out BAs, MFAs, and, and uh, the, the longevity that you've had by owning yourself, going your own way, opening up the doors that were not mm -hmm. open to you, uh, may in fact be to your mm -hmm. credit. And, and, and certainly for someone who, you talk about Thomas Blackshear, I thought he was just the ultimate. Mm -hmm. I still think he, he yeah. might, like you, as a young person, I didn't go to galleries a lot, mm -hmm. museums and all that kind of stuff, but I read comic books right. and graphic novels, so right. I knew all those kind of guys. So I, that illustration thing seemed to be the way to go. Yeah. But, uh, your longevity as an artist mm -hmm. You managed to sustain that mm -hmm. where other artists who were hot for about four years mm -hmm. and now and then you don't hear about them. Anymore. You know, I've been very fortunate um, to have met some incredible, iconic artists while they were alive. Um, Annie Lee was one of them, and Ernie Barnes was another. And when I met Ernie Barnes, um, it was life changing for me. Um, when he looked at my work, you know, he put his hand on his chin and he had his glasses in, in his hand, like by the arm. He's, he had all this swag, right? And I was so intimidated by him. And he said, um, he said, you're self-taught, huh? I said, yeah, for the most part. And I thought he was just going to tear my work to pieces, right? He said, yeah. He said, somebody like you comes along once every 20 years. And I said, I said the same thing. I was like, whoa, whoa. right? But it made me have to reassess, reassess my whole life after he said it, right? So when he said it, I remember I was probably 10 years into my blow up, right? And I kept thinking, somebody's coming. You know what I'm saying? Somebody's coming. 
you know, and then 15 years went by, I said, they're getting close. You know, <laughs> my, my, you know, my time is almost new, up, right? New, so new thing is coming, right? There's, there's new forces coming. And Barack Obama got reelected, I mean, got elected for the first time. And I said, it's a world shift. I said, I'm going to reinvent myself. I'm going to be the new artist that's coming. Uh, right? <laughs> so that's when I started my pursuit towards fine art. Um, a gallery that sold a ton of my print reproductions was known for selling fine art. They sold originals only. And every year they would have um, this big convention in um, Philadelphia at Temple University called October Gallery. And you would have the, some of the top popular artists uh, in, on this gymnasium floor you know, in the country. And it was free and open to the public, and it would be just thousands of people. I've never seen anything like that since. And it was like a rock star. It was like being a rock star when you were there. And they had these things called Super Booth. And you had Charles Bibbs and Annie Lee and Paul Frank Goodnight. Morris, and was Frank there, Frank Morrison. And Frank Morrison Howard. would be there. Um, and, you know, I would have lines around the corner. And my staff would be down there working, and I, and I would be sitting up in the in the uh, bleachers by myself. There wouldn't be anybody else up there. And this guy named Walter Shannon from ENS Gallery in Louisville, he sees me up there. He walks up there. He said, "Boy, you moving that paper, ain't you?" Right? I said, "Yeah, I guess that's that's what we doing here, right?" <laughs> and so he's like, "Man, you don't seem excited." I said, "Is this it?" I said, "How's it going for you?" He said, oh, mine's is different. He said, I just need to write two or three people to come through. He said, because I'm carrying Jacob Lawrence and Elizabeth Catlett, and, you know, I'm carrying that. You know, it's different for me. So I said, I'm going to have something for you one day. Next four years went, I didn't have anything for him. Every year he saw me, he said, you got something yet? Got something yet? Got something? I said, nah, 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 all right? I'm still there doing my thing, collecting, you know, money. And so... He says, I want you to come down to Louisville and do a show at my gallery during the Kentucky Derby, right? And I come to find out after, <laughs> after I get there that in prior years, it was free. The year I came, he decided to charge because he was thinking about the lines of people in Philadelphia. Nine people was at my show, right? But I brought three, four original paintings that I didn't tell him I had been working on. He hangs them. You know, I'm with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. I'm sitting in the corner. You know, I'm, I'm you know, down about the whole thing. And I look up, it's a red dot on it, right? So, the paint was $10,000. And that was kind of their curve, you know. They probably rarely pushed anything over 15K back then, right? And so um, I'm talking to this lady, and she says, I, 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 I had like, this guitar player, right? And she says, I have this Charles White original. I was like, you got a Charles White original? You know, I'm like looking at her like that. And she says, I really like that painting. I, I think I'm going to take that one. And so I'm like, okay, cool, two out of the four done So Nobody's looking at my prints, mind you. I got a whole print gallery over here. Nobody's paying that no mind. They're looking at these four originals. So the third piece sells. So I say, hey, look, Walter, we need to talk. So mm -hmm. I go back to his office. I say, hey, look, you know, you know I've been out here selling prints since 1995. I don't think people are going to go from $20 to $10,000. I like for you to represent me and let me see what I can do. I said, don't do me any favors though. Like if the work isn't selling, just be straight up, tell me it ain't good enough. I'll go back and work on it and get better. Every time I'm sending him a painting, they sell it, right? So um, we ended up working together for maybe seven years and we still work together, but you know, I've gotten beyond their curve, you know, their price point, you know, for a contemporary. They can get it for somebody that's no longer with us, but you know, for myself they couldn't. And um and so that's how I got in. Excuse me, did did with that conversation, did you pull the prints? Mm-hmm. You left the prints there? No. Okay. 
No, the, see, the thing with me is that I feel like the prints, I feel like my, my body of work is like my catalog is like an invention. It's like if I've invented something, why should I stop receiving royalties from my invention? You're not going to tell anybody else to do that. So I don't feel like I should do it. If it's my catalog, it's my catalog. It's not a secret. I, I couldn't pull it if I wanted to, to be real with you. I mean, it's out there in the world and, and, and they've embraced it and I, I, I just can't. I couldn't pull it if I wanted to. At the point that I painted something in 97 and then it's a 19 year old kid in Africa that's an incredible photographer and he's reenacting a painting I did in 97. Wow. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Who wasn't even born. <clears throat> you know, it's like, okay, what you want me to do? It's still going to be out here because it's been embraced. So no. So we end up doing the thing, the gallery thing. Everything's going great. Everything's going well. Pandemic hits. And this is where Ekpay came in. So I'm starting to get DMs from people who are interested in buying my work. So I'm like, okay, cool. So there's a brother in Atlanta, uh, Coach K, who's uh, like an executive with a, a major record label, like that deals with like the Migos and Lil Yachty and all these uh, artists, musical artists. And he was following me. I didn't even know who he was at the time. And so an, another friend of mine, um, Maya Bailey, who's a, a, a world-renowned tattoo artist in Atlanta, was redoing some tattoos for me because I had these tattoos from the 80s, right? And they were horrible. Okay. And so, <laughs> anybody would see me with my shirt off, they'd be like, dude, I think you have better ink. You know, like, you're like a dope artist and your, your, your tattoos are horrible. So, he did some cover ups, you know, for me and stuff like that. And he said, man, I'm opening this place called P Peter Street Station, right? It's gonna be an arts community center. I'd love for you to open it for me. And I said, this was 2018. I said, I've been in Atlanta since 1997 and I've never done a show in Atlanta. I said, but because you're asking me, cool. That was a conscious decision? Yeah. To not do the show now. I, I never had felt embraced by the Atlanta arts community when I got there because, mind you, I had, I had been at a certain level of success in, in 95. So, there's artists that hadn't found their voice yet. And you got somebody riding around town and whatever. And, you know, it's, it, it could be a little bit much. Right. So I never felt like, like welcome like that. And so when Maya reached out to me and, and asked, I did it. And I had one little drawing in the show, uh, a Curtis Mayfield, one of these ink drawings, ink and water drawings. And Coach K hit me, he wanted it. And so I was like, it's, it's sold, right? I said, a brother reserved it online. And so Maya's like, hey, look, dude, this is a solid dude. You need to really, you know, see what you can it's do okay. to make it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I hit the guy that got the deposit on it. He had a minimal amount of money. I said, hey, look, man, I'll make it up to you. You know, I'm gonna need to take this piece and sell it to this guy, right? I know it's not the most ethical thing, but, <laughs> you know, y'all make it good for you, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so I sell him the piece. And that started our relationship. So I turn around and I end up having like a, a, a nice cluster of people in Atlanta just from these two guys, right? And so um, I do the Peter Street Station opening, does really well, pandemic hits, right? So the pandemic hits, right before it hit, I'm on this little list of, of artists to watch, you know, like they do these little, the, top 10 artists, you know, I'm on this list with Black Art in America. And the pandemic hits. And I got shows, solo exhibits, I got everything scheduled for 2020 to just go down the drain, right? So I'm, I'm thinking I'm gonna hit this gear. This pivot is gonna be great. None of it happens, pandemic, right? So things start to open up, right? I don't have anything on my phone, nobody's calling saying, hey, let's do a show, nothing. But because of my history in the print market, when people were looking for images to put behind them on Zoom calls, my own my online my online did record numbers <laughs> during the quarantine of the pandemic. So I'm like, okay, hey, let me get myself an exhibition, right? So I say, okay, I'm gonna get myself an exhibition. So 
I go to see a friend of mine who had me speak at Georgia State Art Department um, to the uh, art students there named Jamal Barber. And he was having his thesis show there. And I go see his show and the uh, director of the gallery is there and she didn't know who I was. And, and you know, I'm like, man, this isn't a nice space. I like to do a show here. She's like, oh, we're booked to 2023. So I'm like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> so I wasn't asking you if you right, could give me a show. Right, I was just right, like, right. I like your space. Right. And so he says, well, they have an a event here called Articulate, and so which showcases emerging artists. And she said, yeah, we, um, we rent it out to them. I said, oh, so you rent? So <laughs> she said, yeah. So I said, what's the number? So, you know, how much is it? Yeah. And she said, she gives me the numbers, and I'm like, is that per day? She said, no, that's for a week. I'm like, okay, great. Yeah. Let's do it, right? So I get the spot. I do the um, social media post. Within 24 hours, 600 RSVPs come through, right? People from all over the country, they flying in. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm not thinking that much of it, you know, people ready to get out. You know, I'm just thinking yeah, people- We're still in the pandemic, right? But it loosened up for okay. a second. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's, that was like that July right. of 21. It loosened up for a second before the next, um, the next wave, whatever the new name came out, you know, probably that next week, the new name hit. So it just felt perfect, right? So I do this show and that's where I had painted like the civil unrest piece during the pandemic um, that featured my daughter in it. And this is 48 by 72 paint that dealt with the year 2020. And, and as events were happening, I, would put, I was putting these things into the painting. And so um, I wanted to show the work because I had been working like everybody, every other artist during the pandemic. I had a show, most of the pieces sell. You know, the numbers were just crazy because there wasn't any split. I had rented the place, wow. right? Oh, yeah. And I'm pushing pieces at a price point that <clears throat> this gallery was a community. It, they just, they probably wouldn't sell anything over five grand in there. You know what I'm saying? Right. So everyone that was tuned in knew that it was the independent event that brought in the collector, yeah. right? Yeah. So then I said, okay, everything went good. Maybe we can, James, I, I mean, of all people, James, <laughs> like this is James, James, my, you know, been taking me around, you know. And, James, right. So, um, so we we do well at the first one. Second one, which was last November, was amazing as well. But I was doing the exhibitions because I was, you know, getting ready to start embarking on a new trajectory with my work and trying to step into the highest spaces, you know. Um, but I needed to kind of show my value to the market as a as a as an independent force. Like I can get these price points on my own without the split. So if it's about the money, that can be done. I want to be able to show what I can do. You know what I'm saying? I want to step into scale. I want to do some other things. So it's good to be at a point now that's completely opposite of where I started at, at 17, 16, where I didn't really like art. I really love art. Love art that. is like, yeah, love I love that. it. I love it. It's, it's like, um, it's, it's like oxygen for me in a sense that um, because I don't do anything <laughs> um, like drugs or drinking anything, like art is the thing that, that I can disappear in. You know, I can take my true emotions and translate them into the work. Um, and painting the figure, there's so many levels to painting the figure. Um, from identification of you know likeness to uh, painting it, which I approach now is from the inside out. So when I paint now, I'm painting the, the, the energy or the spirit from within, and then I deal with the likeness at the, at the, at the, on the back end, you know, with eyes on the nose and stuff like that. I want you to feel it, you know, initially, and then take it in, you know, so. Good stuff, man, awesome. Uh, can we any questions? Anyone hanging on to a question that they've been wanting to ask for like the last 30 minutes? Yeah, no, no, we've been going. I don't know. Oh, hey, man, that's all good. Yeah. That's that? all good. How, how did it all turn out with your father? I was, that was one good Oh, my, my. <laughs> that's the question. The mathematician. Well, yeah, my dad died in, um, in 01. 
Um, he was two years older than I am now, which was re really reminds me of how young he was, um, cancer. And I remember um, going up to Chicago when he first got diagnosed and I was able to show him like my numbers. So with the, with the prints, <laughs> you know, you would have a, because he's a numbers guy. Right, you had your inventory. So it would say, okay, power of woman, which is the woman standing on top of the world, did 75,000 in sales that year. And so it, you had these 52 paintings and the numbers that they generated that year. And when he saw that bottom number, he was like, I understand. Yeah. He, <laughs> so I made it, I put it in his language, which was really, really kind of dope. But I love my dad. You know, it was probably kind of deep because I had this pencil sharpener in my room, in my studio. And I found it when I was cleaning out his things at the school. And he taught all the way up to his death because he said he, he, that's what his passion was, was teaching, molding young minds. And, um, excuse me. And so, um, the pencil sharpener ended up being a common tool between us. He used pencils to solve equations. I used pencils to create art. So that was a, a, a common bond. Man, that's so, beautiful. Yeah. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, because so often uh, you know, we get that message of you're creatively drawn, whether it's music, poetry, whatever it is that you do, particularly if you come from families who are, you know, it's always it's always that case of, you know, get the real job. Yeah. And, and as a parent, I didn't get it when I was younger, but as a parent, you do get this. No. I mean, I get it I don't now. want you to get hungry, yeah. man. I don't, I don't want you to be... You. But, you know, like my dad, he, he bought my first compressor. When I cleaned out his things, all the articles that had been done on me from the beginning was in his locker. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, but he just kind of handled me in a way that I would be a, a, a great provider. He, he didn't believe in coddling like that. So, mm -hmm. um, so you didn't believe in the calling? And co coddling. Oh, like, coddling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. So yeah. it was, yeah. Um, yeah, he yeah. trained a good hunter. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to ask you what you think about uh, I call him Vasquez mm -hmm. and his uh, fame and how much money he ended up making in his art. What do you think about his art? You, you, when Vasquez. he's live or are you speaking Just right about? now? Okay, right now. I think I think that um, that's a you know an amazing talent um, in the arts. You know, hands down. Um, you know, an originator. You know, and so to see how much influence his work has had in the arts overall is an amazing, you know, accomplishment. Um, because of the business of art, you know, it for me it depends on how much his estate is getting of it. You know, would kind of control my joy uh, <laughs> for what his work is going for. You know what I'm saying? Because I work in gold for millions in the secondary market, and we don't see a dime. What so, do you think about the uh, the creativeness of his work? I think it was a, you know it, it incredibly creative. Um, I like all styles of art. You know that's one thing about me. Even though I paint in a in a more traditional classic um, capacity as far as figurative work, I'm attracted to all types and all styles of art. So I, I don't really have like someone that I focus on. Um, <laughs> you know, in in that sense, artistically. You know, just because I have such a passion for art. And as a collector myself of art, I've learned to embrace various styles as well. So. But that idea that you talked about, uh, you live within your world of creativity. You're not necessarily looking for, I see a lot of uh, looking for influences of other people to kind of guide them. And I do remember from my time in art school where they would say, it's fine to have someone that you admire mm -hmm. for a while, but at some point you have to find your own voice, you know? So how do you, you know, for some people they need to make a break from, because everyone seems to copy Jean-Michel. Mm -hmm. Or they copy some bird, they do some variation of Kahindi. Well, I think once you, once you get impact, it's inevitable. Um, so say for instance, if you were naturally in that lane already, and that person just blew up before you, should you be required to change your style mm -hmm. because they blew up first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of times that's what happens. So I think that it's, it's not necessarily, um, I think the influence, like I've influenced a lot of artists, I, I, and I know that, 
I mean, they, you know, all the time, even close friends, you know. So it's it's part of what happens. I think that um, I try to fight trends. Um, I try not to get caught up in trends. Um, just to kind of stay committed to my voice, but I pay attention. You understand what I'm saying? So if you if you, if you notice start seeing drips in my work at a certain year, that's because the pop artists and the graffiti artists were getting traction and there were drips in their work. And so if I go to a major collector's home and I see my work hanging in the environment with their work, then I want it to flow with their work. I don't have to go put a cartoon character in it, but at the same time, I need to respect the evolution of the industry as well. So I stay conscious of it. Um, but I'm from like the 80s, so I'm like hardcore against biting. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, just hip hop culture is like biting is like the worst thing in the world for me. So I try to create imagery that can be original. When I do paint famous people, um, there's a limitation to reference material for them. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of us are going to paint from the same photographs. Um, and then I try to create a narrative that may be a little bit different. You know, even though I'm using that same photo that 10 million other artists drew from, you know, then I try to, you know, deal more with doing more research. I may listen to audio on that individual where I try to get more connected with their spirit and approach the portrait from within and then deal with the likeness on the outside. I like that, Ed. you know, this, this uh, drawing of Malcolm X, you know, how many times, we've all seen the iconic with the, mm -hmm. you know, that one right there, and I've seen all types of artists copy that directly, thinking that they're bringing kind of something else to it, but actually they're really not. Mm -hmm. They may be bringing something graphically, but the energy in Malcolm's face here, as opposed to that more iconic image, mm -hmm. he really does seem like, it really is like you're kind of standing yeah. in front of a nation, talking about something other than yeah. the nation, right? Well, it's, 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 it's ironic that you speak on that piece. Um, I painted Malcolm in that same, you know, that thought pose, right. you know what I'm saying? Right. And then um, I met his daughter, and one of his daughters, Ilyasa, and we became good friends. And it made me humanize Malcolm because I had to have compassion for a, a, a daughter he had that lost their father. And so when I work on works that deal with him now, I have some things upcoming. Um, they're from a whole different perspective because, you know, I, I have to respect the human part, not just, you know, this one image, stereotypical image that you see. So life can kind of change um, how you process things. You know, when I met her, I had that image, and one of the images I had in there was when he was assassinated. And I felt so bad that she was standing in front of it, looking at it, and I had that image in there too. And so, you know, um, yeah, so uh, my love for the figure has grown so much and it's such a more spiritual thing to paint now than it was 10 years ago. Beautiful. Any other questions, any other thoughts? Have you ever had any pushback or an attempt at censorship or any of the content of any of your pieces or subject matter? Subject matter? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, um, geez, geez. um, I recently did a piece um, with um, these guns, right? And so it was dealing with the guns in America and just uh, gun control and choosing peace instead of choosing a peace. And so, um, in the piece, I had this ballerina standing on this stack of guns. And um, it was inspired inspired by a Charles White piece called uh, Birmingham Totem Pole. And, um, and I recently had someone say, well, we wanna do this, sh this show, what do you have? And it's, it's like, I got this and I got this. And they're like, ah, we're gonna do that. You know, we don't wanna deal with the gun thing, you know. And I'm like, well, why not? Yeah. You know, it's, it's clearly an issue. And so, um, you know, and, and, or it may, you know, depict a person that may be more controversial in society and history. So, you know, you're gonna get that, but I think that the art 
Um, I think the art champions it all. I think it's, some work is necessary to be created. I think it can't just be about if it sells or if people even like it or not. You know, sometimes, you know, that gun piece came from every time I turn on the TV is this kid got shot, this person got shot. It was two people, another man shooting. And my daughter, she's 10 and she's like, daddy changed the TV. And so this piece kept coming to me about these guns. You know, it was like a vision and I painted it. I had plenty of other things to do, but I painted it because it kept coming to me and haunting me until I painted it. You know what I'm saying? So you don't know the impact of a work of art. So I think it's important to stay true. You know, even if you got a, like to every three pieces you do for the world, do one for you. You know what I'm saying? Because I think that's important to kind of really see what you really want to say, what you really want to leave behind. Um, because the, I think the highest, so the greatest path to acceptance is individuality. I don't think it's compromise. Yeah. And yet, yeah, so many of us seem to gravitate towards who's already doing something and we kind of come in by, with Biden. <laughs> well, I mean, the Biden is, is I think that's, that's just part of, it is part it's, of just, it's, it's part of the process. Yeah. But, you know, I, I always tell artists that our highest level of payment is acceptance. It's not money. So if we're pushing for acceptance, then we're gonna naturally follow someone that's already been accepted. Very good, very yeah. good, very good. Do you teach at all? Since your dad was a teacher, do you, have you had periods in your life where you teach? Do you do workshops, yeah. do you? Nah, I think my art is teaching. It is. You know, um, no. Nah. But to hear, I, you, <laughs> to hear you expound <laughs> on it is. I just took my first official mentee uh, at the end of last year. And, um, and I've been fighting not to turn her into me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Trying to bring out the best her that she could be. And when she approached me, I picked her literally because it was something that I would just never gravitate to or do. Her medium is yarn, it's textile. You know, it's like, it's like I didn't understand it. It's like, okay, let me do, like one of the reasons that I'm even here today is like, let me start accepting things that I would usually not do, you know, so that I can grow. Sometimes that growth has to come through what you're afraid of doing or don't understand doing and, and say, okay, let be a big artist, since you're a big artist, let's go ahead and be a big artist and let's go, let's go talk to this region yeah. and let's say, okay, hey, let's talk about it, you know? So I embrace, um, I embrace everything about the arts. I think it's, I'm sorry, this is my regular um, alarm. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm used to doing on 415 on Saturday. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so uh, for us locally here, you've never been to Oklahoma before? No. Probably not even conscious on your mind much of it for, for any other reason or any time or anything. Well, right? you know, Tulsa, because I was working on a, uh, a body of work uh, on Tulsa. Okay. Um, so yeah, I had planned on going there, but um, yeah. Well, we're thrilled that you came here. Right. Glad you kind of going out beyond. Certainly. No, it's been real dope. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, it really has been. Is it like um, a foreign country? <laughs> no, it's cool. The people were nice. Everybody that spoke spoke to me on my way walking here, mm -hmm. like everybody. So I felt like, oh, really nice people, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so, you know, it, it was cool. Yeah. So how long have you been in Oklahoma City? Yes, since yesterday. Yeah, leaving tomorrow. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? I see a hand back up there. Did you ever find a female who said you wasn't tripping? No, I didn't look for her. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look for her. I, I pretty much she figured out that, it, that she could see me. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> right, right, right. Any other thoughts? I know we got some. Do we have any young artists in here? We have there's, there's a hand here? back there. I see one. Yeah, I, see one, one. Guy, yeah. I know there's more than that here. But that, uh, they got a question. Yeah. Here we go, please. Uh, what did you feel in the process of making the art? What do I feel? Mm, different things. Sometimes it's joy, sometimes it's rage. Um, you know, it variates. It depends on what the, the narrative is. Um, but 
you know, my wife accuses me of kind of getting into character like actors do. Um, so if I'm working on a, a piece, a, a social injustice, uh, police killings, um, you know, I'm gonna be in a certain vibe for a minute, you know? It's not like just pick up a paintbrush and go to work. Um, it's really, you know, kind of connecting and, and, and having compassion for your subject. Uh, so a lot of times you have to translate and become emotionally vulnerable. Um, so it's, I'm not a systematic technical painter like that. You know, I'm definitely more energy. I probably could mix the same browns twice, you know. Um, that's my self-talk part. And it's also the part that keeps me insecure enough to be driven. Um, so it all works together. You know, I, that, 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 I think it's good for young artists to hear that even at your caliber, your longevity of work, you still have the insecurities as far as that you just kind of mentioned. Oh yeah, every day. It, it never, you never get to a point, I don't think, uh, as a creative, that you don't have moments of insecurity, whether it's because you didn't go to this school or this happened to your life or whatever child it is. Yeah. That, that you're, and I appreciate you being yeah. uh, vulnerable enough well, to my, acknowledge that. My name. social circle has that though. Has you know, one, yeah, they're they educated, they're trained. Okay. You know, I have people I can reach out to and they explain to me some of the things that I do naturally. Um, so that I can understand it and be able to use it in a more powerful way. So I have artists from all genres, levels, ages. Um, I have a circle that's very strong as far as advisors and consultants, as far as looking at the work. And, and, and I got one guy that's especially strong with composition. And once he broke down what I was doing naturally, why my work was so impactful compositionally, then I started to become and, you know, it became my intent to do it, you know, uh, because I understood how it worked. But he was a trained artist, and if he wasn't trained, he wouldn't have been able to tell me and break that down to me where I could understand it and start to use it in my advantage. Look at that as well, this idea of, you know, you've got that idea of the solitary artist in his studio raising war against, this idea of having a circle mm -hmm. of, of people that you can go to. Yeah. You know, I don't know that that's necessarily something I've ever I yeah. don't operate out of that kind of insular me. Nah, I can show you text. Me, I mean, it's me, like, I got right. text. It's like, how do I get this effect? How do I get this color? How do I get this tonality? You know, and they say, you can mix this, this, and this. And then I go and practice and experiment and practice and experiment. But I'm like that on a daily basis. And that's what why the work continues to evolve. If I felt like I knew it all, the work would like literally stay at the same place and probably eventually decline. But because I'm not that comfortable is what um, makes me that uh, aggressive towards knowledge. That's good stuff. Mm -hmm. That's good, and particularly for the young good. artists that are here, and even for us older ones. I mean, you know, that, that's really good stuff right there. I see a hand back there. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because I'm gonna I'm keep it like a hundred, you know, with you right now. Um, I didn't become financially literate till I got married to somebody who was financially literate. <laughs> Second, um, as far as copyright, I think it's good to be knowledgeable of your copyright, but also be conscious that you got to get in. And if you're too guarded and too tight then you just may not ever get looked at. So you have to be able to sacrifice and survive the collateral damage of the move that you're trying to gain. You know, you have to sacrifice, it's like a baseball player hitting a sacrifice fly and you're trying to advance your man. You know when you hit it, it's an out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you make a decision that it's an out because I'm trying to get my man from first base to second base. I'm trying to get on base, a period, you know? So I think you have to be very conscious of the level that you're at at that time. There's a lot of things that I could say at the position that I'm in now that is not going to apply to you. But when I look back at where I was at when I was beginning, I was selective about the work that I did that made me look the best. That was, I, I, I exposed my strengths. You know, I hid my weaknesses you know, as I worked on them. If I couldn't draw hands, then you get handless people, 
until I got dope in hands, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, um, I think you have to be uh, fair with yourself and assess yourself correctly. Um, and have someone kind of in your sights that you want to get to. You want to be like that person to get to that level. I think it's okay to be predatorial as an artist. Um, I think that it's not always a, a kumbaya group hug scenario. I think sometimes it is very uh, tactical and aggressive and you have to take a spot to have a spot. You know, so um, I'm giving you both sides of me. Uh, I mean, I hope it's cool, you know, but you know, Ek Pei knew who he invited here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that idea of when you're young and, and the financial literacy and contract, I mean, the experiences that you had early on where you got, you had the one business partner that was working there for years, you had, you know, people that were, I think in a way that's kind of what she's speaking to, sometimes you may have to take a loss. Yeah, but it's not it's not a loss, no. though. It's exactly. like the, the knowledge that you exactly. get from it, it prevents it from being a loss. It's like when I came out of that partnership, I knew that I would never start over. I was starting anew, but I was never going to start over because I had my name was at a certain level when I came out of it. So it was worth the collateral damage. It was worth the money. It was worth all that because I wasn't there before the relationship. And so I can look at the relationship and say, okay, hey, this was worth it for me. You know, at the same time, I try to keep a rule of only letting that happen once. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Any other? Wanted, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I want to you. just praise you. I mean, you, you. You've done a lot of work. Oh, thank you. And, uh, you know, competition is stiff. I know there are artists everywhere. But listening to you and all the things that you worked hard to get, and you were, both, you were trying to go to another direction in the beginning and ended up doing what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank you and praise you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Because I know hard work. Yeah, it's, it's still not hard work though. You know, working on that truck was <laughs> hard work. So, it's not, it's not that kind of hard work. You know, we still love it and have a passion for it. And even you, a you know, man too. thank you, thank yeah. you. Because <laughs> somewhere there, somebody's still hauling up those bags off that truck. Yeah, they not Encyclopedia Britannica anymore. Yeah. You know, Amazon or something. Amazon or something. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Hey, listen, we uh, if we don't have any more questions, and of course, you know, I. Please take the time to look at the work, enjoy the work, uh, immerse yourself in the work before you leave. And um, uh, this piece right here is very, oh, real, quick before, real quick before we oh, kind okay. of this out. Tell us about that piece, how, okay. it, came, how it came into being, uh, who the model is, mm. uh, give, us, give us kind of a... The brother that um, uh, I selected for this piece, um, he probably passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but he worked at a friend of mine's uh, auto body shop. And in the piece, I wanted to deal with how long he had been carrying his sign. And so I wanted the worn edges to the sign and the confrontation of him blocking your path um, to just deal with him and um, to level up as, as a world, that he's not three-fifths of a human being. Um, the blood splatter on the lower corner of the protest sign is uh, Dr. King's blood uh, from the sanitation workers um, strike in Memphis. Um, so that's basically what that piece deals with. Uh, the splatter, kind of paint splatter mm -hmm. here. The, the paint splatter kind of came, yeah, came from um, I just got tired of what I was doing, and I was like, let me just approach this from a, a, a after I meditate, let me do these abstracts, you know what I'm saying? And then let me have another meditation period where I try to envision what is coming from that abstract. And I remember uh, when I did a piece earlier uh, that was inspired by an unfinished sculpture of Michelangelo's. Um, I noticed that the figures were within the stone and he was trying to free them. You know, that's what was said. And so I started to approach the work from that perspective because I wanted it to be a little bit more organic and reactive instead of controlling. You know, um, I like control work, you know, um, 
But sometimes I feel like you lose a lot of the beginning process and the beauty of the art. You know, it gets lost, it gets covered up by the time you finish the painting. And so the course of, and the control, in the course of trying to maintain some yeah, degree of control. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's where that came from. Um, the drawings were done in uh, pen and ink. Uh, they're on watercolor paper. The pens are water soluble, so when they get wet, they bleed. Uh, the dry areas are rubber cement or, you know, watercolor like mask. Um, the technique was shown to me or given to me, and let me just say that, by a gentleman named Paul Goodnight, who was an incredible artist based out of Boston. And during a period of his life when he was younger, he was confined to a bed and he would draw in the bed and he spilled his water on the drawing while he was working and that's where the technique came from. Um, the James Baldwin is my last piece that's in the uh, exhibition. And the James Baldwin, I had never done a painting of James Baldwin and I knew people liked them, you know, and I knew that they would buy it, but, <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, I want to do a James Baldwin. And then I, you know, because of my path and how I go about things, I started to research them. And as I started to research them, I was like, man, this is an intense dude. You know, he was confrontational, man. He was like a, like a giant. And so I got this thing I do when I'm working on putting images in environments that they're not in in the photo. So I, I go to find out how tall they were, you know, their weight and height, stuff like that. You, and, you go that deep. Yeah, and he was uh, five, five feet, four inches tall. So I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make him a giant, you know, in this painting, and I want him at a scale that you have to deal with him, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I looked into, you know, his sexuality and different things like that. And I just really wanted to pre take that out of the picture but have it in the picture at the same time because he was so bold. And the colors chosen for the city and the sky was to um, reflect his prism of how he saw the world. Um, not in a general color, but you know, in a more dynamic way. And so those are the pieces that I, I have here. But yeah, the sun, you know, well, I'm sorry, the sun symbolizes um, his spirit rising daily. So that's why it's behind him like that. Good stuff, man. That, that's really great. Yeah. All right, oh, any other way in the back, please? Could you stand up, please? Hi, I'm Ayana Najula. Um, welcome to Oklahoma. Thank you. Um, there's a lot going on in Chicago as mm -hmm. it relates to uh, community development, in keeping up with the work of Theaster Gates and some mm -hmm. of the work that he's doing. Yes. Uh, I was reading your website and you just to say a lot of the work that you are doing is around uh, black love. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the work that Diaz is doing has a lot to do with loving your community. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak to what you may be doing with him or if you're doing anything with him and what's happening in Chicago and what's the, uh, what's the um, narrative there in terms of being able to pass on something that you may be able to, that you may be doing in Chicago that we can do here in Oklahoma. Yeah, as far as Chicago goes, um, my agenda artistically in Chicago is is kind of relative, um, you know, globally. Uh, I haven't selected any particular agenda to do in Chicago. I'm trying to basically, in my work, shine a light on, you know, who we are as a people. The crime is, is immensely uh, disturbing for me in, in my hometown. Uh, my mom and my sisters are still there. And um, it's something that I, you know, I lose sleep over at night. You know, it's, it's, it's a rough situation. It was rough when I was coming up. But, you know, I think with the arts, once you can kind of position yourself, you know, if I was based in Chicago, I would probably, you know, definitely be more hands on with an agenda for Chicago. Being based in Atlanta, um, I'm definitely trying to do my part within the artistic community. Uh, and with kids in general to just expose them to other outlets. You know, for myself, I painted and drew a lot just to stay out of trouble. I mean, that's just how I spent my time. And, and it, it did me, you know, well. Um, my early work deals with black love a lot. Um, my later work, current work, is definitely more based in history. 
um, and knowledge of self. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, it grows and it varies. I, I don't really go off, to, you know, on topic of what's happening right now too often. You know, um, I created a piece in 2013 called It's Not a Game, which deals with a, a carnival game of the duck shoot. You know, um, you shoot the duck, the little yellow duck, and, and, and the center head of it is a black male, and he's the highest score. And it's unfortunate that that painting is relevant this week, next week, next month, you know, even with the Tyree Nichols, you know, um, but I painted it in 2013, as, you know, well before George Floyd or whoever, you know what I'm saying? There's always been someone. You know, the names change, but the incidents kind of stay the same. So I feel like as though as, a, as an artist, um, there's a high responsibility to not only elevate and educate culture, our culture, but to inspire culture. You know, my goal initially is to inspire my culture and my race directly, but also, like I said in the beginning, to enlighten humanity uh, of the diverse nuances that we possess as a people. Um, and crime is crime, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's, like I said, extremely disturbing. And, you know, having children, having a 25-year-old son, you know, and a 10-year-old daughter, and, you know, being a dad and, and uh, just being a, a man. You know, I could have walked over and it had been a different situation. Thank God it was people that were speaking and they were just nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it was cool. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. When, you, when, I, when I asked about the black, black love question, based upon what you just gave as your answer, as I looked at this young woman here, in some regards, they're almost the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you just elevating it to another level mm -hmm. and, and giving people something to think about in terms of the messaging. Um, yeah. around who we are as African people, or people yeah. from the African diaspora. Yeah, I think, you know, like I tell young artists this a lot, you know, based on when I was born, you know, in 65, I'm going to come from a, a witnessing of certain things in my life, you know, and, and if I paint what I've witnessed, you know, if I'm, if I'm 10 years old and 75, then I'm in the middle of, 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 of black love, afros, platforms, bell bottoms. I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years old. I'm taking all that in, you know, the Ohio player covers right, right, and, right, right. you know, and, and different things. And in the 80s and hip hop and the development of that and, and, and entrepreneurship and urban culture. And so I'm, I'm a, I feel like a true reflection of the era that I've, I'm living in and have lived in. So... Um, there will be a baton that other artists will have to pick up that's from future generations, you know, and what they paint. Hopefully they'll paint some things and paint, that will bring some enlightenment and truth to the world and not just, you know, decor, so. And I have no doubt that when they're looking around for someone to kind of help guide them towards that, they'll look to you. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> we thank you so much. Can we give it a Robert Peterson is here, and I, where are you, Robert? Uh, did he leave? Maybe dipped out. We gotta get back to Walmart. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I was going to have you go up and introduce yourself to him and look at the exhibition, and uh, thank you. Mm, thank oh you. my gosh, thank <laughs> you so much. This thank has you. just been wonderful. Before we wrap, I bet you have seen my text. So he says, peace to everyone. He says, thank you for being who you are. He says, thank you for coming to the city and to keep loving you and to keep flourishing. That's first. Second, he says he hopes that the conversation was enlightening and engaging, and hopefully it empowers someone to step into their own glory and create in whatever form they see fit. And thank everybody. Awesome. Uh, That's for Oh, Skip, yes, thank you. You did an amazing, amazing, yes, amazing job. Could not have done this without you, for real. I did. She contacted me about it. I was like, wait, wait. You talking about black? You talking about Oklahoma City? Thank you, Barbara.